It's Sunday, October 10th, 2021. The USS Ronald Reagan is returning from her deployment in support of the Afghanistan drawdown, and due to the low intensity nature of the conflict, is operating with a smaller escort than usual, the USS Shiloh, a Ticonderoga class guided missile cruiser, alongside the USS Barry and USS Curtis Wilbur, two Arleigh Burke class guided missile destroyers are all that remains of her at this time. In the carrier's absence, not all has remained peaceful in the South China Sea. Repeated clashes between Philippine and Chinese fishing ships, the latter likely members of the People's Armed Forces Maritime Militia, an asymmetrical naval force comprised mostly of small civilian vessels, has led to numerous Filipino fishing boats being fired upon and ultimately sunk. With tensions at a fever pitch, the People's Liberation Army has opted to deploy a surface action group to the Spratleys, consisting of a Type 054A guided missile frigate, as well as two smaller Type 056 corvettes. It has also forward-based a handful of aircraft to two airfields within the Spratly Islands, Subi Reef and Mischief Reef. The ramp-up in tensions has not gone unnoticed by the United States, with another Arleigh Burke-class destroyer, the USS Mustin, being dispatched to bolster the Reagan's Carrier Strike Group 5. On top of this, Carrier Strike Group 1 has been surged from its base in the United States to conduct deterrence exercises with Carrier Strike Group 5 once it reaches the waters surrounding Japan. Before linking up with the Ronald Reagan and her strike group, the USS Mustin will perform a freedom of navigation operation within the Spratly Islands. These exercises involve sailing through another nation's claimed territorial waters, exercising an international protection called Innocent Passage, where so long as no wartime activities are undertaken, such as the gathering of reconnaissance, firing weapons, or interfering with communications, the vessel is legally protected during the duration of the voyage through these waters. This is a common strategy employed by the US Navy to promote compliance with such freedom of navigation laws. In this instance, it is done with the intent of deterring Chinese aggression, showing American resolve to regional allies, and effectively communicating, you don't want smoke, to the People's Liberation Army Navy. Due to the heightened tensions, all ships are on relatively high alert. The USS Ronald Reagan has three Super Hornet squadrons ready for immediate combat operations, two armed with the standard air-to-air -air complement, another armed with the RGM-84 harpoons for anti-shipping duties. Another squadron of Super Hornets is also on elevated alert, able to be crewed and armed for anti-air or anti-shipping within the hour, as opposed to the 90 plus minutes it normally takes. On a racetrack pattern close to the strike group, and within the protective A2AD bubble it affords, flies one E2D Hawkeye, callsign, baseplate, providing airborne early warning and control to a four-ship formation of FA-18Es, part of a constant combat air patrol the Ronald Reagan keeps in the air. Beneath the waves lurks the USS Seawolf, likely the single most advanced hunter-killer submarine in the world. She'll be supporting the Ronald Reagan, patrolling to her north in search of China's recently sortied carrier strike group. The Chinese carrier strike group, centered around the Sandong aircraft carrier, comprises of two Type 052D destroyers and two Type 054A frigates, alongside the air wing of 26 J-15s, two squadrons of which are intended for fleet air defense. Unlike the largely multi-role capability of the US carrier-based aviation, supporting assets aboard the Sandong includes a handful of Z-18 helicopters for airborne early warning and anti-submarine warfare, as well as a token complement of Z-9 helicopters for light cargo and ferrying troops. Unlike the American carrier, the Chinese carrier is not in a state of extremely high readiness. While certainly in a higher state of readiness than normal, due to the imminent commencement of exercises, not all aircraft are ready to participate, and as such, only a single squadron of J-15s is armed for immediate sorties. Additional vessels deployed during this period include two Type 0398 Yuan submarines, transferred from the North Sea Fleet in recent days, which patrols the east and west ends of the Spratly Islands. Due to the proximity of the American Carrier Strike Group to the exercises, an independent Type 054A frigate has also been tasked to shadow the American Carrier Group for the duration of the exercises, as has been done many times in the past. The recent actions of the PLAN has not been to directly incite a conflict, but rather to push the normative boundary further towards Chinese control of the South China Sea. For this reason, as tense as the atmosphere may be, China does not foresee a clash coming of it. The United States does not view the situation quite the same way. From Woody Island Airfield, a flight of four JH-7AII's take off, accompanied by an escorting J-11. These aircraft, 
as part of a broader exercise in the region, will be performing a mock attack on the USS Mustin, not unlike the mock Tu-22 backfire raids seen so frequently during the Cold War. Shortly into their flight, the E-2D Hawkeye, base plate, picks up on the formation on its search radar. Relaying this to the USS Mustin, the information is viewed with wariness, but not alarm. Additional F-A-18E Super Hornets are considered to provide air cover in the region, but overflying a number of HQ-9 surface-to-air missile systems, which the US perceives to be on a hairline trigger, is deemed as a poor decision. In the Spratleys, the Type 039A Uran-class submarine charged with patrolling the eastern end of the island chain is shadowing the USS Mustin. Under normal circumstances, as capable as a 039A may be, an Arleigh Burke-class destroyer stands a good chance of detecting the submarine. However, due to innocent passage laws, the Mustin is not permitted to conduct any anti-submarine warfare activities. With her sensors cold and traveling at close to 25 knots, the Mustin does not detect her tail. As the range to the Mustin draws close, the flight of JH-7s light their afterburners, flip on their radars and jammers, and plunge down to low altitude. The flight of JH-7s dips below the radar horizon, disappearing from base plate's radar screen. Not able to turn on her own radars, nor conduct any activities which could bolster her defense, the USS Mustin is effectively blind. This fact is not lost upon her captain as, minutes after the contacts drop, the Mustin's slick 32 passive electronic intelligence suite picks up a torrent of jamming coming from the JH-7's last known bearing. The computer systems aboard the Mustin rapidly gives an estimation of the jamming aircraft's range. Close too close, and closing rapidly. Furthermore, the telltale signature of a fire control radar is detected among the tsunami of noise being put out by the JH-7's jammers. Determining this to be an existential threat to the vessel and her crew, the captain's nerve breaks. The Mustang's targeting radar crackles to life, instantly resolving the aircraft's location. As the JH-7's approach to less than 20 nautical miles away, the AN-SPG-62 radar illuminators aboard the Mustang lock onto the aircraft. Perceiving this to be a legitimate threat, in the heat of the moment, the crew aboard the Mustin salvos eight RUM-162 ESSM missiles, two at each of the JH-7s. Faced with an incoming salvo of missiles, the JH-7 pilots make a split-second decision. Despite having a firing solution, the notion of firing upon US vessels is not within their calculus, and they opt to immediately and violently evade the incoming missiles. However, at this range, the outcome is a foregone conclusion. Three of the four JH-7s are destroyed. The lone survivor, tail between his legs, heads home and is deemed a non-threat and is not re-engaged. While the USS Mustang was firing on the flight of JH-7s beneath the waves, the Type 039A submarine shadowing her was listening in on the entire engagement. Following a heated debate between the officers aboard, it is decided that the only scenario in which a US destroyer would begin firing a large amount of missiles while conducting an innocent passage transit is if it intends to destroy Chinese vessels. As such, the crew of the 039A opts to retaliate in kind. The submarine fires all six of its loaded torpedoes, targeting the USS Mustin. Detecting the launch transient on our now fully manned AN-SQS-53C sonar array, the Mustin immediately swings the rudder hard aport. As soon as it is out from behind her, the Mustin rapidly gains a high-confidence solution on the offending submarine. It is immediately decided aboard the Mustin to engage and destroy the threat. She salvos four RUM-139C anti-submarine rockets to the location of her sonar contact. As they impact the water, they release their payload, a total of four MK-54 lightweight torpedoes. As they search for their target, the Mustin is running for her life, deploying her SLQ-25 Nixie torpedo countermeasures all the while. However, the Mustin is facing modern torpedoes, which are not easily fooled by decoys, and at such a close range, there is no outlasting them. Impact. The first torpedo detonates underneath the left screw, knocking out all propulsion aboard the vessel. In rapid succession, another torpedo detonates just forward of the previous hit. With all propulsion knocked out, she now has fires abound and nearly all of her stern compartments are breached. With water flooding into the vessel, and despite sailors fighting the casualties as best as they can, the order to abandon ship is given. Meanwhile, the Type 039A isn't faring any better. While the USS Mustin is taking a beating, the Mark 54 torpedoes acquire and track down the submarine. And despite the 039A's best evasion efforts, she too is hit by a torpedo, and breaks up under the sea. 
As the Mustn slips underneath the waves, there is a flurry of diplomatic activity between Beijing and Washington, desperately attempting to avoid further escalation. However, with such a momentous loss of life and hardware, there is no longer any room for detente. The USS Ronald Reagan launches two additional four-ship flights of F-18E Super Hornets for fleet air defense, as well as beginning the readying process for the 4th Super Hornet Squadron with heavy counter-air loadouts to engage in fleet defense operations. While the aircraft are heading out to their patrol locations, let's take a moment to reflect on the actions of the day so far. While the JH-7s were not sent out with the goal of actually attacking the US destroyer, their provocative actions can easily be seen as an existential threat to the safety of the crew. This is an example of the fog of war, which manifests throughout the scenario in the form of understandable, though mistaken, actions. Although technically firing the first shot, if one takes into consideration the situation the Mustang's captain was in, and the unprecedented, belligerent behavior of the JH-7s, it would be far from accurate to call the United States the aggressor. Now, back to our battle. The Chinese have not responded to the situation quietly. Upon learning of the destruction of the USS Mustang and loss of contact with the in-theater 039A, Chinese Theater Command opts to sortie the remaining aircraft at Woody Island, Subi Reef, and Mischief Reef to protect the airborne early warning, tanker, and maritime patrol aircraft which have been on a racetrack pattern to the north of CSG-5. The Sandong aircraft carrier will also contribute to this force, with a four-ship flight of J-15s, alongside two airborne early warning helicopters within her air wing. Additional AEW and MPA airframes, as well as a number of drones are sorted from Lingsui and Jialaishi Air Base in Hainan, all available H-6 bombers from Guiping Su Air Base, belonging to the PLAN's 1st and 23rd Air Regiments are placed on the highest level of alert, and are ready to be launched at a moment's notice. Upon reaching their patrol zones, the three flights of Super Hornets receive instructions to destroy the three BZK-005 drones which have been surveilling the Ronald Reagan and her escorts for the past several hours. Believing that the USS Mustang was attacked unprovoked from the air and subsequently sunk after defending herself, taking a Chinese vessel with her, the captain of the USS Ronald Reagan has sensibly opted to prioritize fleet protection over politics. Deeming the Chinese drones to be of limited escalatory value and an effective way of degrading ISR coverage of the American carrier group, destroying them is seen as a prudent way of protecting his force from any further unprovoked aggression. In the northwest, Scarface fires his AIM-9X Sidewinder and destroys the BZK-005 without incident. Hammer, however, faces an entirely different situation. Tasked with targeting the drone in extremely close proximity to the 054A frigate, Hensui, which has been shadowing the carrier strike group, he fires a sidewinder. As it impacts the drone, Hensui sees this and interprets it as a broader attack on Chinese aero assets in theater. The captain decides to fire upon the flight of FA 18s in accordance with his orders, yet, this ultimately serves only to push the situation further up the escalation ladder. Eight of her 32 HQ 16A surface to air missiles are fired two at each of the aircraft. There is scarce time for the Super Hornets to react. However, these missiles are not as capable as the US ESSM and only two Super Hornets are destroyed. Opting to conserve her munitions so as to be capable of weathering a counterattack, the Hensui does not further engage the flight of Super Hornets. Immediately upon being informed of this, the commander of the USS Ronald Reagan authorizes a strike against the Hensui. Twin four-ship flights of FA-18Fs from VFA-101 launch from Reagan's flight deck and immediately begin positioning for an attack. Simultaneously, the USS Shiloh as well as both flights of Super Hornets release their RGM-84 harpoons. Immediately dipping down to a handful of feet above the surface, the harpoons blaze towards the lone frigate. Detecting the threat, the Hensui lets loose a wall of steel from her remaining loaded VLS cells, each HQ-16 missile hurling towards the incoming harpoons. However, despite a valiant effort and a large amount of successful missile intercepts, the Hensui is unable to halt the overwhelming hail of munitions. She suffers multiple waterline hits, sinking the ship alongside with most of her crew in a matter of minutes. With the loss of a major service combatant and on top of other recent losses, the PLA deems this the gloves off point and sets its aim on destroying the American carrier. The Americans, however, Anticipate this and deploy two additional flights of Super Hornets, 
all available air counter air begin flying north to engage and destroy the Chinese tankers, AEW, and MPA aircraft. As the Hornets fly north, however, they are met with an unwelcome surprise. The J-11s and J-16s defending the aforementioned high-value assets are armed with the modern PL-15 missile, a Chinese counterpart to the American AMRAAM. Developed specifically with the intention of outranging the AMRAAM, it affords these aircraft armed with them the ability to take the first shot, an opportunity which is not passed up by the PLA. Seeing the missiles, the Americans charge onwards, understanding that their missiles will need all the kinetic energy that they can get in order to maximize their PK, or probability of kill. Lesser airmen would have immediately gone defensive, a noteworthy example of the superb amount of training and experience American naval aviators have under their belts. Once the AMRAMs are fired, however, the American pilots being fired upon quickly make a break for sea level, knowing that if they drag the PL-15 missiles down into thicker, denser air, they will lose speed faster and have a harder time maneuvering. The opening salvo is largely ineffective, fired at such a long range that PL-15s are low on energy by the time they meet the Super Hornets. Despite launching over a dozen missiles, only five Super Hornets are hit. The American counterfire, however, is devastating. Out of the six Chinese aircraft which launched the initial salvo of PL-15s, four are destroyed outright, with more AMRAMs still incoming. Despite the PL-15's longer range, the AMRAMs benefit from decades upon decades of institutional expertise in designing air terror missiles, and as such is able to achieve a vastly higher kill probability. In the West, the Chinese J-15 flight is engaged by American Super Hornets. Armed with only the PL-12, the significantly less capable predecessor of the PL-15, the four-ship flight of J-15s doesn't even get a chance to fire before being knocked out of the sky by AMRAMs. Due to the capabilities of the Super Hornets' radar, the J-15s don't even know that they're being targeted until the AMRAM's onboard radar activates and directs the missile in, in its terminal guidance stage. Despite the American technological advantage in missiles, the Chinese aircraft refuse to go down without a fight. The final J-16 in the engagement charges forth, determined to buy time for further Chinese airframes to arrive in the defense of the high-value assets he has been charged with protecting. Firing off all of his missiles against a horde of American Super Hornets bearing down upon him, he forces the American pilots to go defensive, buying as much time as possible for Chinese reinforcements to arrive. Fate is not kind to him on this day, as all of his PL-15 missiles fail to hit their targets, and his aircraft is shot down. While the initial air exchange is happening, the largest combat launch of aircraft in decades is underway. From Jalai Shi Air Base in Hainan, a total of 60 aircraft from the 22nd and 24th Air Regiments, all of the available aircraft capable of being launched in short order begin doing so. In addition to the air superiority mission, the previously readied H-6 bombers launch from Gui Pingming Su Air Base and head south to provide additional offensive firepower to the strike on the USS Ronald Reagan. As the Super Hornets press on northwards, many of the initial F-A-18s have expended their long-range air terror munitions and are forced to return to the Ronald Reagan to rearm as swiftly as possible. This time, the United States will be faced with a much more even-numbered fight. Two additional four-ship flights of J-15s have been sortied from the Sandong aircraft carrier and raced to their comrades' aid. Three remaining J-11s provide a last line of defense against an aerial attack, and recognize this as an existential threat to the assets that they are guarding. Sallying forth and firing their PL-15 missiles at the Americans, they are once again met with the steady nerve from the more experienced American pilots. Holding off on evasive maneuvers until they are able to fire off their own munitions, the Americans countervolley with their missiles, and then immediately hit the deck. The Chinese score several hits, three F-A-18s destroyed with the first volley. However, this comes at the cost of all the aircraft firing that initial volley. Yet again, the American technological edge in missiles proves to be the deciding factor. The two flights of J-15s, still rushing to disrupt the American attack on Chinese ISR assets, enter within the range of American AMRAMs and are fired upon. Like the previous flight of J-15s, these are wielding only the outdated PL-12 missiles, and are thus unable to get the first shots off. However, these AMRAMs are the final salvo the westernmost Hornet flight is carrying, and after only one J-15 is taken out, the flight is essentially a sitting duck. Both flights of J-15s fire missiles at the Super Hornets, two at each aircraft for a total of eight missiles screaming towards the Super Hornets. Going defensive, the flight of F-A-18s are left unscathed, not a single missile is able to hit its target, a testament to the obsolescence of the PL-12. During this time, the remaining two AMRAMs from another flight of Hornets are fired at the J-15s. One of the two AMRAMs connects, destroying another Chinese aircraft. However, a second volley has been fired at the initial flight of Super Hornets. Going defensive once again, the F-A-18s are again able to evade all of the incoming PL-12 missiles. 
the J-15s fire yet another salvo, most of which is targeting the initial F-A-18 flight. These missiles finally score a hit and destroy one Super Hornet. The other missiles of the salvo, targeting another flight of Super Hornets, achieve more success, destroying two F-A-18s. However, this is the last of their long-range air terror missiles, unable to do more against the AMRAAM-laden F-A-18s. The J-15s return to the Sandong to hopefully rearm and sortie again as soon as possible. Unbeknownst to the J-15 pilots, the Super Hornets are also nearly out of munitions. The final flight of F-A-18s have merely two AMRAAMs between them. Determining that due to fuel concerns, they are incapable of reaching the high value targets before they escape to the A2A D bubble of their own CSG, they opt to return home. Turning hot towards the fleeing J-15s, the Super Hornets let loose both of their remaining AMRAAMs. Both impact. While the last of the previous engagement's Super Hornets are returning home, the 4th Squadron finishes readying. Armed with the maximum amount of missiles an F-A-18 can carry, they are going to be even more capable than the two squadrons which had just engaged the Chinese aircraft and come out on top. Believing retreat to be an effective symbol of defeat, and emboldened by his successes so far, the commander continues towards Japan and ultimately the protection of other US 7th and 3rd Fleet assets. However, what he does not yet see is the wall of J-11s descending upon him from the north. While the J-11s are transiting towards the carrier, the final four F-A-18s from the original two pre-readied air-to-air squadrons are sortied, heading to the original racetrack pattern to provide a forward counter-air presence and discouraging Chinese ISR assets from resuming their actions further south. At the very edge of its detection radius, the E-2D Hawkeye detects a single air contact to the north, seemingly coming from Hainan Island. Shortly thereafter, it detects a few more. Shortly after that, a lot more. The captain of the Ronald Reagan recognizes this as far more than Chinese reinforcements to protect their ISR assets. He orders an immediate launch of all aircraft ready for air-to-air -air missions from the newly readied Squadron 4. With the carrier also conducting recovery operations as well, the sortie rates of the USS Ronald Reagan drop, and it takes longer to get all three four-ship flights airborne. Once this is managed though, the Super Hornets make their way as far north as possible to engage the mass of J-11s. Upon reaching approximately 100 nautical miles from this enormous formation, the F-A-18s turn on their AN-APG-79 radars and feel a jolt of adrenaline as they see just how many J-11s are out there. Closing to their weapons employment zone, they unleash a rain of missiles the likes of which has never been seen before in any air engagement in history. Missile after missile erupts from the pylons of the F-A-18s, which are utilizing the radar's track while scan capability to lock up and fire upon multiple targets without missing a beat. These J-11s, although numerous, are only armed with the PL-12 missiles, reflecting the low availability of the PL-15 in the Chinese inventory. Without the reach to counterfire, the J-11s have no choice but to go defensive and roll with the punches. However, against a missile as capable as the AMRAAM, these defensive maneuvers do little to save them. It is a slaughter. J-11 after J-11 is destroyed at an unbelievable cadence. Across the board, in a matter of seconds, dozens of airframes are sent hurling out of the sky without so much as a single countermissile fired in return. In all, 37 aircraft are destroyed. However, while this is an immense tactical victory in the largest aerial engagement fought in decades, the Hornets are out of missiles. With no choice but to return to their carrier to rearm, there are now zero aircraft capable of guarding the carrier and her E-2D Hawkeye from the J-11s that remain in the air. With nothing left to stop them, the Chinese J-11s continue southwards. The westernmost group of the formation splits into two elements. One continues south and will attempt to engage the E-2D Hawkeye, and the other will break to the east and continue escorting the H-6 bombers to their weapon employment zone. It is at this point that the Chinese anti-ship assets come into range. The Shandong Carrier Strike Group fires its 32 YJ-18s. These missiles have a trick up their sleeve. At the end of their subsonic sea skimming flight, they have a solid rocket booster which will give them the ability to sprint the last portion of their attack at an extremely high speed. The Yuling Surface Action Group, slightly closer in time such as the salvos will arrive simultaneously, launches its YJ-83s, a less sophisticated but still potent sea-skimming anti-ship missile. As the YJ-83 laden flight of H-6s closes to within missile range, it lets loose a torrent of munitions. 
All of his YJ-83s are selvelled in rapid succession, side by side with the YJ-18s. At the same time, the carrier strike group begins to fire upon the incoming missiles. From all of Ronald Reagan's escorts, SM-6s erupt from VLS cells, allocating two per munition so as to destroy the incoming missiles at as far a range as possible. Immediately after launching this first salvo, the CSG launches additional SM-6 missiles to counter the J-11s attempting to engage the E-2D Hawkeye, one per aircraft to conserve munitions. It is at this point in time that the Chinese forces commit the rest of their munitions to the attack. First, the H-6J bombers salvo their entire complement of YJ-12s, targeting the carrier escorts. Destroying them will render the Ronald Reagan effectively defenseless, unable to intercept the PLA's trump card. From northwestern Hainan, DF-21D anti-ship ballistic missiles stream forth from the launchers of the 625th Brigade. These missiles are unable to be intercepted by most conventional interceptor missiles, and traveling at an immensely high speed, even the few munitions that can intercept them will have a difficult time doing so. The American CSG, however, is no easy target, detecting the sea-skimming YJ-83s from the Yiling Surface Action Group. It again launches a furious barrage of SM-6s towards the incoming missiles. This happens just as the first missiles of the initial salvo are beginning to intercept their targets. The interceptor missiles are only partially effective. While nearly all of the H-6 launched YJ-83s are successfully destroyed, the YJ-18s make it through the withering barrage largely unscathed. As the last missiles of the first level intercept their targets, the first missiles of the second level begin intercepting theirs. Against the Yuling's YJ-83s, the SM-6 missiles wreak havoc. They successfully intercept the entire package of missiles. Against the aircraft, the missile performs similarly. A large chunk of the J-11 force is destroyed outright by the initial volley. However, despite the immense success the CSG has enjoyed so far in intercepting incoming missiles, it is beginning to run low on its own SM-6 interceptors. Following up on the remaining airborne J-11s with SM-2s, the CSG prioritizes its SM-6s for intercepting enemy munitions. Her last few remaining SM-6 missiles are fired at the incoming YJ-12s and proving deadly effective against them. As the last of the SM-6s are depleted, the CSG switches to its numerous but short-ranged ESSM missiles. Letting loose a deluge of RIM-162s, the strike group attempts to intercept the incoming YJ-12s. While most intercept their targets, even having the Sea Wiz pitch in, a single missile gets through. It slams into the superstructure of the USS Shiloh, crippling her and putting her out of the fight. Simultaneously, the cascade of DF-21Ds began entering their terminal phase, before being crippled the USS Shiloh manages to get off a handful of SM-2ER Block 4 missiles, specifically tailored to intercept such ballistic missiles in their terminal phase. As the DF-21D missiles draw nearer and nearer, the SM-2 Block 4s manage to intercept a few of the re-entry vehicles, but it is simply not enough. Multiple DF-21D warheads traveling at Mach 9 impact the USS Shiloh, the USS Ronald Reagan, the USS Barry, and the USS Curtis Wilbur. While these ships are immensely survivable, multiple hypersonic re-entry vehicles filled with explosives cause too much damage to handle. Despite crews heroically fighting casualties, all vessels give the order to abandon ship shortly after impact. The fa 18 still in the air, low on fuel and without any friendly bases to fly to, begin making their way towards Vietnam. As if to add insult to injury, the YJ-18s activate their rocket motors and sprint towards the sinking husk of the Ronald Reagan. Multiple missiles impact before she finally slips beneath the waves. The E-2D Hawkeye is swiftly engaged and destroyed by the few J-11 still airborne, who then return to base. Off the coast of Vietnam, out of fuel, the FA-18s conduct a mass ditch into the sea. Meanwhile, the survivors of Carrier Strike Group 5 wait in the ocean, dazed, waiting for rescue.
this simulation still simplifies a significant chunk of the tactical and operational challenges in a real-world flashpoint. For every detail we've managed to include, there are many more we've had to omit. Join us on our talk show, Hype Ops Fox 2, where we host a roundtable discussion with various experts and discuss the challenges and technical details of attacking a carrier strike group in the nitty-gritty detail it properly deserves. You might have noticed that every single aircraft in this simulation has a unique call sign chosen by and representing a fan. If you would also like to appear in our next video with a unit under your chosen call sign, leave a name followed by your call sign in the YouTube comments below and a unit bearing your call sign will appear in a few weeks time. We're always in need of hundreds of new call signs for our simulated wars, so if you want to bolster the ranks of the Hype Ops Army, volunteer for service in the comments below. We're growing the Hype Ops Discord community to complement the channel. If you're interested in discussing the latest military developments, current geopolitics, or listen live and even contribute to our Fox 2 talk show, that and much more on our Discord server. Eventually, I hope to draw on the Hype Ops community for pilots and captains to command individual aircraft and warships in a more realistic command structure in future scenarios. More details to come later, I've left the Discord link in the description below. If you've made it this far, thanks for watching. Please, like and subscribe if you want to see more content like this. We're always dreaming of making bigger, more realistic, and more complex military simulations, and your support is what makes all this possible. Thank you. That's all for now. Until next time.